G-String has one of the most misleading titles you could possibly give a game. It has nothing to do with women's undergarments. It instead feels like a combination of Ghost in the Shell and Half-Life 2 if the whole thing was directed by David Lynch or David Cronenberg. Apparently over 10 years in the making and created by a single female dev, this thing is a follow-up or remake of sorts to an original Half-Life 2 mod of the same name. And for about the last week or so, I've been slowly chipping away at this thing, making my way through its 10 or so hour long campaign. I don't want to get into a whole argument about whether or not someone should be able to charge for what's basically just the Half-Life 2 mod. But either way, it is kind of hard to ignore just how unique and extensive the whole thing is. Instead of a scientist, you're playing as a gifted teenage girl named Mio, who must face the perils of the future, just like the rest of us in a seemingly endless metropolis as the world around you implodes, just like the rest of us. And instead of a HEV suit, you're wearing a standard issue bio suit that even has its own informational voice just like Gordon's iconic outfit. Standard issue bio suit message system initiative onboard GPS unit battery damage you can even look down and see your arms, legs, and torso, which looks like a combination of Darth Vader's suit and the Nazi elites from Wolfenstein. Now, you've probably not heard many people talking about this thing, and I think part of the reason why that is, is that the protagonist just hasn't been marketed properly, and she doesn't look like this. She lacks a voice, she lacks any kind of distinctive physical features, and as a result, she lacks a personality. And it's a damn shame, because this really, I think, is one of the most unique shooters I've played all year especially when it comes to the presentation and how the whole game world's been constructed. So, seeing as cyberpunk seems to be the go-to genre these days, how about we dive into this thing and see what it's all about then? Now, I said before that the game kind of feels like a combination of Ghost in the Shell and Half-Life 2, and I think that's a pretty good broad way to sum the whole thing up. Set in some kind of dystopian shithole with a mix of Eastern and Western influences in the architecture, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean symbols adorning the sides of buildings, and Asian models featuring prominently on billboards and advertisements. There's a real sexual undertone to the world building in this thing too, and it seems every location you explore has some kind of vending machine selling ladies unmentionables. Not to mention the streets are populated with faulty or just outright broken sex robots. Though it seems in the future you're limited to choosing from only two models, and both of these look kinda horrible. And I'd rather stick my junk in a vacuum cleaner than either of those things. Anyway, it's that common vision of the future that we've all seen before, where society is clearly on the decline and humanity's just kind of been lumped together into one spot. People who can afford it have left the planet and headed to colonies on Mars or Venus. I mean, it's even gotten so bad and the air's become so toxic that you just need to buy air filters just to breathe. So clearly the whole thing hasn't worked, and this is a world that's gone to hell. The closest thing we get to the police force is a militaristic group of soldiers systematically eliminating every trace of life. And it's not too different to the image of the Combine soldiers moving through City 17. As for the story itself, I mean, I'd be lying out of my ass if I said I had any idea what the hell is supposed to be happening. The game opens with a cinematic in space that kind of looks like they're paying homage to the opening of Star Wars Episode 4, before some guy with the most impractical looking helmet design I think I've ever seen starts talking about a bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with the immediate plot. Mayo seems to have some kind of mysterious backstory surrounding her origins, but it's given away to the play in fragments and even then it's really obscure and abstract stuff. There's a dreamy-like room that they keep showing that kind of looks like a combination of the bedroom from the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey, along with the red room from Twin Peaks, and just like both the film and that TV show, the interpretation and the meaning behind this isn't really explained. Anyway, after old mate with the air fryer for a helmet stops talking, it then cuts back to Earth and we're now controlling Mio. Is it Mio? Mio? Whatever. Yeah who's suddenly trying to escape the city after it turns out that an AI program's become self-aware and turned all of the sex robots in the area hostile. I think at this point the goal just becomes to get off Earth, so you start moving through the city to find a nearby spaceport and hopefully stow away on a ship and then get off world. Right off the bat, the HUD and the controls are going to feel instantly familiar to anyone who's ever played Half-Life 2. About the only difference is that you don't have to worry about your flashlight or your air supply ever running out. And also, Mayo has a pyrokinesis ability, which is only used a handful of times for a couple of puzzles, and I think every single time, the game is going to outright tell you that you'll need to use it. 
and I think I should give a fair warning that this is not a super fast paced game. This is a campaign with a slow, slow burn. There's 15 chapters in the game all up and it sure takes its sweet time getting there. God, shut the fuck up. A lot of the time it just really feels like you're playing an extended version of the anti-citizen one chapters from Half-Life 2. Now I'm still unsure if I should be calling this a mod or its own game, but either way this really has to be one of the most unique and creative looking things to run on the Source engine in recent memory, and I think some of the environments are just downright incredible. During the first few chapters of the game as you're moving through these lower levels of the city, almost every single room and area you move through as you explore these dilapidated and crumbling apartments just looks downright photographic. And I found myself stopping almost every time I turned a corner just to look up at the sky and take in my surroundings. In a lot of other games you'll see a theme or a motif that just keeps getting reused throughout the entire level. It seems like every time you enter a new room or an area in G-String though, it's entirely unique. And there's locations that you'll move through once and then never see again. Kind of shows a tremendous sense of creativity in regards to the level design that's something that's really seldom seen especially for something like this that's been created by almost a single person. And honestly, there's just never really been anything like this in the Source engine before. It's like watching some kind of cyberpunk themed art film come to life. Yes, I'm sure you made the right decision, however... At one point you're even flying around in a spaceship over Earth and you almost forget that you're playing a Source engine game for that brief moment. It really feels like you're moving through these environments that are the remnants of a society that's just crumbling around you. I almost kind of got like a futuristic Silent Hill vibe from the whole thing too. In the way that the art style works with that grungy industrial vibe juxtaposed with the images and themes of body horror. Like that image of the mutilated female robots crawling around on the ground and limping towards the player. Combined with the constant use of female beauty ideals popping up on posters or billboards. And it kind of makes me think that the person who created all of this stuff might have a bit of a mild case of body dysmorphia. You can customize a whole bunch of the visual effects in this thing too to get it looking exactly how you want. From changing something like the depth of field effect through to the amount of motion blur or the lens flare. The thing is though, while it may look good in an artistic sense in terms of how it plays out as a shooter, it's often not all that great. I mean, these rooms might serve as good examples of interactive contemporary art, but navigating them can often be a frustrating and clunky pain in the ass. And I think the reason for that is that you're just constantly moving through doorways and down hallways that are barely big enough for you to even fit, squeezing through vents and platforming across ledges, along with dealing with very poor visual communication from the level itself and directing the player to wherever the hell it is you're even supposed to be going. And Jesus fucking Christ man, the amount of goddamn crouch walking in this thing is just ridiculous. I'm talking about moving slowly through vents and narrow pathways. I mean seriously, so much crouch walking. I'd say it's at least 30% of the entire campaign that's spent crouched and moving through vents or tunnels that are about the size of your mum's corn shoot. And nothing actually happens during any of these bits either. I mean, it does highlight the claustrophobic nature of the environment and the game world, but it's not really conducive to smooth and flowing gameplay. It's the kind of thing that shows little consideration for the player's time. This train ride sequence is a good example too, and it's really just little more than a dynamic slideshow, where you just kind of sit there looking out the window as the world passes you by. And yeah, it looks cool visually, and for the first couple of minutes it's interesting, but it could have gone for a fraction of the time and still had the same effect. Then there's the constant platforming, jumping across pieces of garbage, sticking out of puddles of hazardous waste. Platforming was never a strong point for Source Engine games, and it's honestly got no place here either. A lot of the time too, I felt like the path that you have to take feels more like the kind of thing you do to find a secret area in any other game. Do you know what I mean? Like I'd follow some kind of random path thinking it wasn't even the right way forward, but lo and behold it was the way that I was supposed to be heading. The world of G-String is a hazardous one too, and the amount of things that can damage you or just outright kill you in this game is just insane. From toxic fluids through to acid rain, and some of these are impossible to see coming. And I've seriously lost count of the amount of times I've just randomly died from something.
As a result of all of this, it really, I think, is the best looking, but often bad playing game I think I've ever experienced. So if you are gonna check this thing out, which I do recommend, well get ready to bind a button on your keyboard to no clipping because you're gonna need it. You'll often get stuck in walls and objects and it's far simpler just turning no clip on and flying out of it than mashing the jump button or having to worry about loading a quick save. In defense of the level design though, they sure do give you a whole leap of ammo and health items, so you never feel like the game's pulling out the rug from beneath your feet, which is kinda handy because you're gonna get into a whole heap of gunfights in this game, and it doesn't really pull its punches either. Instead of the gravity gun, you just wave your hand around like you're a Jedi or something and pick up physics objects to hurl them around. And instead of Gordon's iconic crowbar, you've got a hammer. Your starting gun is a handgun, which is really just the USP from Half-Life 2 that's been reskinned. And the SMG is the same as the MP7, even down to the grenade launcher attachment. And even more than that, both of these almost have the exact same reload animations. There's the shotgun, which again handles exactly like Half-Life 2's, and another weapon called the wave gun, which is just a reskinned pulse rifle. And of course, the laser-guided missile launcher is just the laser-guided RPG. They may have different sound effects and different magazine sizes, but it still can't shake the feeling that they're just those same weapons at its core. It's like copying someone else's homework, but changing around the handwriting and trying to still pass it off as your own. Even the basic enemy forces in the game are soldiers similar to the Civil Protection and the Overwatch soldiers, with the tougher enemies serving the same function as the Overwatch Elite. They even have that same running animation and lob grenades at you in a similar fashion, though these guys seem to use grenades a hell of a lot more. You'll see those similar gun turrets which you'll again need to knock over, and snipers hiding in nearby buildings with those very distinct laser sights. And look, all of this is fine and it doesn't really bother me, but if you're not the kind of person who likes how the shooting works in Half-Life 2, well, then you're probably not going to like this. Because I mean, very little, if anything at all, has been done to change it. Aside from the fact that it seems enemies do even more damage now, and as a result, you're going to die a lot quicker. Yeah, I'm not kidding, Sonny Jim. You go down like a bag of shit in this thing, even on the so-called normal difficulty. And I lost count of the amount of times my health just vanished within seconds before I'd even realized what happened. G-String does have a few bugs that are also holding it back at the moment. Thankfully, I haven't experienced too many of these, but they are about on par for what you'd expect for a game that's had a bit of an insular development cycle and not been open to much player testing or feedback. There's a lot of talk I've seen online of people having their entire save files corrupted, making them unplayable. And I know that at one point during the middle of a chapter, my save files just inexplicably stopped loading. And I had to restart the entire chapter from the main menu to keep playing, which wasn't that much of an issue. I think G-Shrink could have really benefited had it been opened up to community engagement and feedback. I mean, look, I haven't really kept up with the development of this thing, so I don't know if that's something they actually worked on, but getting player feedback on some aspects of the level design or the combat might have worked wonders on how the whole thing played overall. Ah, shut the fuck up. As it is, it's a pretty damn polished 10 or so hour long game, and you can say all the time and effort is gone, but it also could have been a 7 or an 8 hour long game, with all the fluff and the padding removed and been a much more intense and streamlined experience. Still though, look, I think this thing is worth praising, and it deserves acknowledgement simply because of just how much time and effort has clearly been put into it. It's kind of funny to me too that at a time when people are always looking to spotlight females in the gaming industry, that when something like this comes along made by a single female dev, that those same crowds don't even so much as bat an eyelid. I don't know, but I guess that would actually force those kind of people to actually play games, which is far more effort than simply complaining about them. I guarantee though that you'll never have played anything quite like G-String before. And for a game that lets you shoot malfunctioning sex robots and urban explorer dilapidated cyberpunk shithole, it is pretty damn hard to fold. Shut the fuck up.